Good morning and welcome to Bethel. We are so excited that you've decided to join us this Easter Sunday. What a great day to be uh, in church. What a great day to be uh, visiting church. We're, it's just such a great day. Uh, before we get into anything, my name is Brandon. I'm the Next Gen Pastor here, and I just wanted to say welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we uh, have a word from Pastor Joe, we are going to just go over a couple of announcements. The first being that if you are just checking us out online or you are new to Bethel and you want to get connected, we have a link in the description for a Connect card. That's just an opportunity for us to uh, be able to reach out to you, be able to uh, send you an email, give you a phone call, uh, get to know you a little bit and have an opportunity to build a relationship. We love relationship here. Uh, we love community and we believe that uh, if you if you want to be a part of that community that you are welcome here. Uh, along those lines, on April 24th and May 1st, both days, two days, we are having our Bethel Life course. This is just an opportunity uh, for you as, a, as an individual in the church to be brought in uh, as a member, this is our membership track. This is our course to understand church history. This is our course to understand where the church is going. This is our course to understand who you are and how you best operate and fit in the body of Christ. So if you are interested in membership, if you're interested in learning about how you best fit or how you best operate in the body of Christ, or if you just wanna feel uh, like you belong that much more, you are already welcome here and you already belong. Uh, the Bible tells us that you've been bought with a and put a spirit of sonship on you you've been adopted into the family of jesus but if you want to belong that much more and stand with us and be a part of this community that much more uh, we'd love to see you at bethel life so if you are interested uh, there will also be a link for that down below you just fill out a interest card uh, and then a pastor will reach out to you and then finally we have our life group signups, another way to connect in community. We love community at Bethel. So we have life groups, they're running signups throughout the month of April and the first day of life groups is on May 1st. So if you're interested in being a part of a life group, uh, please check them out. Uh, we have some, uh, just a little bit of a blurb about who's leading life groups, uh, what they're doing, different things like that on our website. Uh, there will be a link to that also in the description. Uh, so if you're interested in that, if you're interested in just getting together in community, if you don't even attend our church, but you want to get to know people at the church before coming to church so you can have relationships, then this is an awesome way to just build a community of people who, who love you and support you. So if you're interested in that, please check it out. Uh, but without any further ado, uh, here's Pastor Joe with a message. Have a lovely Easter Sunday uh, and God bless. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Bethel Online. I'm Pastor Joe, and I'm going to be bringing the word uh, this Easter morning. You know, one of the comments I often get preaching uh, here at Bethel is uh, I get a lot of comments on the fact that I choose to preach in sneakers. Well, I want you to know I'm not alone. Did you know that there's actually an Instagram account dedicated to pointing out famous pastors who have designer sneakers? It's preachers and sneakers uh, for the curious. And while I have nothing against a nice pair of Nikes, um, as much as the next guy, if you, I have to admit that there's a little bit of irony um, about a preacher owning a thousand dollar pair of sneakers. Now, don't get me wrong here. Don't misunderstand me. I have nothing against big churches or um, you know pastors getting a living wage or any of those kinds of things. Um, get the good news out there. I'm more so reflecting on what it means to be famous today. And the road to glory is often more about our ability to brand ourselves today more than anything else. It's more about that than um, it is about our character or our substance. And the allure of fame is all too real. It's not just for pastors, but for all of us, you know. Um, and so just for kicks, pun fully intended, I googled the top most followed people on Instagram, people who have this the huge worldwide following. So here are the top 10 insta-famous people in the world today. Number one, soccer legend Cristiano Ronaldo comes in with 410 million followers. Second is Kylie Jenner who has 316 million followers. I'm not entirely sure what she does. 
Uh, another soccer icon is number three, L Lionel Messi, with 310 million followers. Uh, number four is pop star Selena Gomez, 301 million. Actor Dwayne The Rock Johnson, come on, 302 million. Uh, number six, pop star Ariana Grande with 298 million followers. And number seven, again, I'm not entirely sure uh, what she does, but Kim Kardashian has 290 million followers. Number eight, the queen bee, Beyonce Knowles, has 241 million followers. Number, coming in at number nine, another Kardashian, Chloe, has 224 million. Uh, you know, it's worth noting that all of the Kardashians combined have 1.2 billion followers, not million, billion. Uh, you have to combine the population of North America and Europe together to get that kind of following. And finally, coming in at number 10, last but certainly not least, fashion icon, philanthropist, voted Time Sexiest Man Alive three years in a row, Joe Bot, with a grand total of 218 Instagram followers. Now, uh, you might be laughing, but I mean, I have to say that that's, that's pretty good considering that if you follow me on Instagram, pretty much the only thing that you're signing up for is an annual photo of my wife on her birthday. So, I think that's pretty good. But when I think about being famous, right, I often think about amassing this, this huge following of people, of the, of the wealth, of the comfort, and the prestige um, that comes along. Essentially, when we think about being famous, we think about ourselves. And yet, the most famous man who ever lived seemed to resist fame. And that man, of course, is Jesus. And from my perspective, Jesus' greatest moments would have been teaching, performing miracles, maybe feeding you know, a crowd of 15 to 20,000 people. But Jesus had a different understanding of, what it, of fame. He had a different understanding of glory. And so I want you to lean in this morning as we listen to the words of Jesus in the week leading up to his crucifixion. We're going to be taking a look at John chapter 12, starting in verse 23. Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. So this is, this is the moment. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me, because my servants must be where I am. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven, saying, I have already brought glory to my name, and I will do so again. When the crowd heard the voice, some thought it was thunder, while others declared an angel had spoken to him. Then Jesus told them, The voice was for your benefit, not for mine. The time for judging the world has come, when Satan, the ruler of the world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. And you can hear the tension in Jesus. His soul is, is deeply troubled. He does not want to go to the cross. He knows the suffering that is before him. His desire is to be spared from the pain and the suffering. And yet he knows that this was the reason that he came. This was the moment that he was born for. This was the moment of his glory. And Jesus understood that his death was going to be the means, the victory of God. One man would die alone, bringing on a harvest of new lives. You know, and looking back, it's hard to deny Jesus' claims, no matter what you believe. Right? Today, there are more than 2 billion Christians worldwide. 
And that's to say nothing of the countless others who've gone on before. No single person has shaped the course of history as much as Jesus. And so wherever you you find yourself on your spiritual journey this morning, whether you identify as a believer, um, whether you're here because you're you're spiritually curious, or uh, maybe, you know, someone uh, twisted your arm into turning on the YouTube and, and watching this today, I don't know. We're all faced, no matter where we come from, we're all faced with the same question. How did one man's death shape the course of history so profoundly. And in order to understand, we have to view the cross from the perspective of Jesus. You see, he saw his role, his whole life, leading up to this moment. Jesus knew his death on the cross would be seen as nothing less than the fullest revelation of God. In his own words, Father, bring glory to your name. And so, if you're taking notes this morning, our first way that the cross reveals um, who Jesus is, is the, the cross is the revelation of God. If you want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. He himself, who is God, came to earth in human form. Throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus performed many signs that revealed his divine nature. Now, Jesus would be lifted up from the earth, as the ultimate sign of who he is. All of the signs that we've been talking about point to and culminate in this moment. In John's account of of Jesus' life, he records seven different signs that Jesus performs that reveal his identity. And over the past several weeks, we've taken a look at each of these in turn. And yet all of these pale in comparison to the sign of the cross. Because it's on the cross that all of the signs are fulfilled. Let me walk you through that. See, when Jesus turned water into wine, he showed that he had come to do, um, that what he had come to do was far greater than anything that had come before. He was coming coming to, to bring in the new covenant. But it was only on the cross that his blood poured down crimson red, bringing in the new covenant. In flipping tables at the temple, Jesus declared that he was the new temple, the new way to a relationship with God. And on the cross, Jesus was lifted up between heaven and earth as the only mediator between God and humankind. When Jesus healed um, the child uh, on his deathbed and, and, and commanded the paralyzed man to rise up, Jesus was was revealing his divine identity as the life-giving judge. Yet, it was only on the cross that he, as the judge of the world, took judgment upon himself so that we could have new life. When Jesus fed the 5,000, he declared that he alone was the bread of life, the only one who can satisfy that, that longing, that emptiness in our souls. And when we look to the cross and we see the self-sacrificial love of Jesus, it fulfills our deepest human longing to be loved as we are and not as we should be. In healing the man born blind, Jesus revealed that he is the light of the world who opens the eyes of the blind, both physical and spiritual. And on the cross, he was lifted up for all to see that He is the Son of God, to bring us from spiritual darkness into glorious light. And finally, by by raising Lazarus from the dead, the most in-your-face sign, He revealed His authority as the resurrection and the life. Yet, it is only in His dying that He could come to life again on that Easter Sunday. See, so each and every sign finds its fulfillment and its full meaning on the cross. And so Jesus is the fullest revelation of God because He Himself is God. And nowhere is that clearer than on the cross. And it's impossible for God to be revealed without His love being on display for the whole world to see. And that's the second way that the cross reveals who Jesus is. The cross reveals the love of God. You cannot write a more tragic story. It's impossible, technically. 
Those are the thoughts of uh, Canadian psychologist Jordan Peterson on the cross. And while he's, he's not a Christian, he goes on to dissect the, the story of the cross from a technical, clinical perspective. He says, it's the story of the aggregation of everything that people were afraid of. There was no death more painful than crucifixion. That's why the Romans invented it. It was to punish political miscreants. It was the slow, agonizing death by suffocation, essentially in dehydration and exposure. Extraordinary, pain, extraordinarily painful. And you know, when we dissect the crucifixion of Jesus, we see that it heaps tragedy upon tragedy. Right? As we've already read this morning, Jesus knew that his death was coming. He had to live in that angst, in that, 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 that uncomfortable dread um, the entire week leading up to his crucifixion. He's betrayed on, on the night of his death by one of his closest friends. The very people who followed him and praised him turned against him. And let's not forget the fact that Jesus is completely innocent and everyone knows it. And yet they choose to release a criminal instead of him. The Roman governor didn't believe in truth. And so as a result, he's completely indifferent to what happens to Jesus and he gives him to the mob to be crucified. And Jesus, you know, he dedicated his entire life to helping others and, and to serving people. And he is still utterly abandoned, shamed, and suffers the most bitter death imaginable, completely alone. And yet for Jesus, this is the moment of his glory. Not the moment when he had thousands of followers but the moment that he was abandoned and alone and suffering. Why? Let's let Jesus answer that question. In another conversation with his disciples in John 15, Jesus said, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. He did it for love. The God who owed us nothing gave everything. You know, as we've been walking through our sign series, we've made the observation that the signs of Jesus not only reveal who He is, but if we pay close attention, they reveal something about us as well. And so we have to ask ourselves, what does the cross reveal about me? You know, am I, am I like the crowd, swayed by the jury of public opinion? Or perhaps like, like Pilate, Truth is whatever is expedient or convenient. Perhaps the, the very idea of the divinity of Jesus offends you. Like the Jewish leaders whose, whose only complaint when Jesus was being crucified was that the sign above his cross read King of the Jews instead of he said he was King of the Jews. Maybe you're like Mary, the mother of Jesus, weeping at the foot of the cross. You've experienced devastating loss and tragedy and suffering. Perhaps you're like the disciples who, who abandoned Jesus and denied him when the chips were down. See, if the cross reveals anything about human nature, it's this. The Son of God came to earth full of grace and truth, and we killed him. The cross exposes the depths of our depravity and the love of God reveals our fear and hatred. And yet, Jesus scorned the shame. In Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 6, it's written, He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be made whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. See, the cross is the fullest revelation 
of the love of God. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There is no mistake, no sin, no pain, no suffering, no horror so great that Jesus cannot bear it. Indeed, He already has. And all that is left for us is to believe. And so the cross is the revelation of God. It's the love of God on display. And finally, it's the victory of God. The instrument of barbaric cruelty, the moment of utter abandonment, the weight of sin too great to bear, and even death itself only serve to accomplish God's purposes. You see, Jesus defeated evil not in a display of power and might, not by striking people down with lightning or, or opening up the earth and swallowing them up, not by waging a war against the, the tyrant um, empire of, of Rome. His road to glory was the road of the suffering servant. See, in the other Gospels, there's stories of Jesus casting out um, demons, but not in John's Gospel. And we have to ask ourselves, why is that? And the reason is this. Because John wants to make something abundantly clear. And we hear it in Jesus' own words in that passage that we read earlier. The time for judging the world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. See, the final victory over all the powers of darkness, the moment of Jesus' glory, the day of reckoning was the cross. Jesus didn't defeat evil by waging war, but by letting it do its worst to him. When Jesus cried out, it is finished on the cross, he, he cried that out on the cross, not at the resurrection. In his last dying breath, sin and death are swallowed up in victory. The cross is enough. It's always been enough and it always will be. You know, when I, when I think of the cross, I, my, my mind is always drawn to the, the words of, of New Testament scholar known, known worldwide, um, N.T. Wright. And he, he describes the cross so beautifully. He says, Jesus took up his own cross. He had come to see it too in deeply symbolic terms. Symbolic now, not merely of Roman oppression, but of the way of love and peace, which he had commended so vigorously. The way of defeat, which had, he had announced as the way of victory. And unlike his actions in the temple in the upper room, the cross was a symbol, not of praxis, but of passivity. Not of action, but of passion. It was to become the symbol of victory, but not the victory of Caesar, nor of those who would oppose Caesar by Caesar's methods. It was to become the symbol because it would be the means of the victory of God. And yet, the glorification of Jesus would not be complete without the resurrection of the Son of God. It is Easter Sunday after all. And if you continue to read John's Gospel, you can feel the excitement of John as he recounts the first Easter morning. He shares eyewitness account after eyewitness account of the resurrection in the last few pages of his book. And you can read them in, in John chapter 20. But I just want to highlight one of these stories this morning. I want to take a look at John chapter 20, 19 to 23. It says, that Sunday evening, this is the, the Sunday that Jesus rose from the dead. The disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his sides. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, you were forgiven. If you do not forgive them, you are not. They are not forgiven. 
Now there's a lot in there that we could unpack and take a look at, but what I really want for you to, to, to hear this morning is there's two invitations there. And the first invitation is to receive Jesus. Receive Jesus. You know, when his, he, his presence, uh, when he shows up to the disciples, fear gives way to peace and joy. And this is the new life that Jesus promised, a relationship with him. And so Jesus invites us to receive him, to believe that he is who he says he is, to understand that we can't earn his love, we can't be good enough or smart enough or famous enough. All we can do is believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died conquering sin and death and rose victorious. And if you're here and you would like, you know, if you're watching this morning and you would like to receive Jesus, in a moment I'm going to give you a, an opportunity to respond in prayer with me. The second invitation that I have for you is show the world who Jesus is. You know, there's a good chance that if you're, if you're watching this morning, it's because you already believe. You've already made the decision to follow Jesus. But you need to understand that your story doesn't end here. Your story doesn't end at the resurrection. That's where it starts. Because Jesus' doesn't, story doesn't end at the resurrection. Listen again to his words. He says, Peace be with you as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. The resurrection propels us forward on mission. In the moment of new life, we are sent out in community and empowered by the Spirit. We have the honor and the responsibility to carry on God's great rescue mission to the world. If the cross is the victory of God, then the resurrection is the birth of new life. See, the Christian life is shaped by the cross and empowered by the Spirit. Let's, let's talk about that for a second. Shaped by the humble suffering and self-sacrificial love that Jesus showed on the cross. Not looking out for our own interests, but for the interests of others. But yet we're empowered by the Spirit. Empowered by the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. We're given the boldness and the authority of Jesus. And so, <laughs> Let me back up a bit. We're given the boldness and authority of Jesus when we act in his will. Let, let's, let's clarify that. And so, we cannot, we must not keep the good news of Jesus to ourselves. Show the world who Jesus is by your words, by your actions, and ultimately by your love. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus, to die for us, to take our sin and our shame. I thank you that he rose again on that third day, launching us out in new life and on mission. And, and Lord, I, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. I, I, I recognize that the way I've been living my life is, is, is wrong. It's left me empty. And I need you, Jesus. Come and, and be Lord of my life. I want to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, if you prayed that prayer, I want to let you know that you have just taken your first steps on your journey of being a Christian, a follower of Jesus. And I would love to hear from you. Uh, down below is our In Touch card, and um, I would love nothing more than to be able to share, uh, to connect with you. Uh, because it's Easter Sunday, we're actually baptizing people this morning. People who've made that decision to follow Jesus want to publicly display their, their faith through the practice of baptism. Um, now, you're not going to be able to see the baptisms this morning, but we've recorded their testimonies for you to encourage you and to... Um, inspire you this morning. So take a look. Hi, my name's Kayla. Um, when I was a little girl, I used to come to this church and I went to a girls club here too and I loved it. 
Um, my parents passed away when I was 13, and then my I had two older sisters that passed away as well, and they all died from their addiction. So my life started to spiral out of control, and I followed the same path for a long time, and I gave up on my faith, and I just gave up on everything. and. I was in a really toxic relationship for 13 years and a few months ago I ended up leaving my boyfriend and I started coming back to church a lot and made a whole bunch of new friends and new connections and my life has changed a lot since then. I'm a lot happier now, I'm feeling better than I have in a long time. The other day when I was in my car I was driving down the street and I was listening to worship music and I had this, I don't know, this like overwhelming feeling of like peace and joy and I actually had to like pull over because I started crying and then everybody's like, well, that's the Holy Spirit. And I felt really good since then. So yeah, I'm, on, I'm feeling a lot better than I have in a long time and I'm doing well and I know that I can do well if I stay on the right track and my life might be pretty good one day. Why am I ready to be baptized? I don't know, I'm just ready. I'm ready to be baptized. Hi, my name is Jonathan. Um, I accepted Jesus into my life when I was a young child, I think I was six or seven. Um, I was raised in a Christian household and I didn't really understand what it meant to be a Christian for a long time. I kind of knew what my parents did, I knew what my siblings did, I knew what my grandparents did. But at the same time, I had a lot hard time understanding that God really loved me and God really forgave me. Um, eventually, when I was about 16 or 17, one of my friends said, Jonathan, you know that God actually loves you? And I'm like, and I kind of took a step back and I was like, do I? And I didn't, I still hadn't figured that out. Um, I was kind of carried on with high school, carried on with university or college, tried to go off to Summit, Bible Co Summit Civic Bible College and dropped out very early on with a depressive episode. Um, then as an adult, I had kind of realized that God really did love me and God really did have a plan for my life, but at the same time, I hadn't fully given everything to him. Um, recently, probably actually late February to be honest, and around that time, I was talking to my aunt, who's actually Ray Kell's mother, my auntie Brenda, and she said to me, Jonathan, it's not your act of will to seek repentance. It's that Jesus loves you that leads you into repentance. and that did really change my life. It really did change my perception on how God loved us and how God's love actually changes us. Um, with that knowledge, I did recommit my life to Christ early in March, right after my grandpa died. And I've started to live a life differently with that knowledge because with that knowledge, I've understood that because God loves me, I can love others, I can love myself, I can love more wholeheartedly and more selflessly because it's not about me, and it's not about my actions that are save me. It's about God's love that saves me. And that's the reason I'm getting baptized this Sunday, or today, I guess now. And I'm so thankful that God loves me and that God's been faithful to me through all the struggles I've faced in my life. And that even though I have walked away from him or not wanted to talk to him, God still loves me and God still loves you too.